Now, options do come with a load of jargon that a lot of people end up like walking away from because of, and the Greeks are really important and it, they involve the Greeks, but I'm not going to get into that right now because I wanna make this as simple as possible for you guys to understand. Okay, so this is options for day trading during the market analysis course. Now, some of you, I'll just start by saying some of you don't actually trade options. So this might be a class that maybe doesn't pertain to you too much, um, but it might be something that at least interests you. So if you're here and you're listening, even if you don't trade options, I definitely encourage you to pay attention today, um, especially if you have a small account or if you wanna get into positions and not use too much of your capital, even if you have a big account, uh, they can be really good for that. So I'm just gonna kind of walk through how you can take positions using options as the vehicle. Uh, most of the strategies that you guys are learning in PCT can be applicable to options as well. You might just have to tweak it slightly, but you know, breakout trades and cam reversals, they could all be used in uh, with options. So it's just a vehicle. Uh, we're trading the same thing, but uh, it's just a, a means to an end here. So let's go ahead and dig into this. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about what are options and how do they work? So for those of you that have absolutely no idea what options are, we're gonna just cover that quickly. Advantages and disadvantages options versus equities and the capital required, a breakdown of risk management, in the money, at the money and out of the money. So this is ITM, ATM and OTM. These are just terms for uh, your option strike prices and applying options to popular strategies. So what are options and how do they work? So they are a financial instrument that gives the holder the right, the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell the underlying asset at a predetermined strike price before an expiration date. And let me break that down because that might be a little wordy for some of you. So basically, when you get into an options contract, there's a strike price. So the, the predetermined price. So even if, let's say, Apple is trading at $190 in an equities position, you can actually buy a strike price in Apple at pretty much any price out there. So I don't have to buy a strike price at 190 just because Apple's at 190. I can actually buy contracts at 195. I can buy them at 180. I can buy them wherever I want to. And basically what this does is it gives me a the as the holder the right but again not the obligation to have these shares at expiration. Uh, at this particular strike price if I want them. Now for intraday option positions, we're not actually looking to end up with the shares at the end. We're trading the contracts back and forth um, as the trading vehicle. So where some people might get it, might get into an options position um, into a contract and then when that contract expires, take the shares for the position, what we're doing here with intraday positions, that's not necessarily the case. So we're getting into the contracts and out of the contracts, just exchanging the contracts back and forth rather than exchanging the shares back and forth. So there's two types of option contracts. There's calls and there are puts, as simple as that. So if you buy calls, you're technically long the stock. So if I want Apple to go up, I'm, or if I think Apple's gonna go up, I buy calls. If I buy puts, I'm technically short the stock. So if I think Tesla, for instance, is going down, I'm gonna buy puts on Tesla. They're traded in contracts, like I mentioned, and each contract is, each single contract is, is holds 100 shares, meaning that at expiration, if you were to let this contract turn into shares and you were to get shares out of the contract, it would be similar to having 100 shares of a position. Now, options do come with a load of jargon that a lot of people end up like walking away from because of, and the Greeks are really important and it, they involve the Greeks, but I'm not going to get into that right now because I wanna make this as simple as possible for you guys to understand. Now, the reason why options can be really interesting though, with the Greeks in mind, is that whereas an equity will move with um, just price by price. So if Apple's at 190, it goes to 191, it goes to 192, it's very, uh, like we can look at it and say, it's risen a dollar, it's gone $2. And no matter what, 
those prices, they just exist as is. But in the options world, there's a lot of other things that, uh, that um, affect the price of the premium of a contract. So as Apple, let's say, is moving from 190 to 191 to 192, option contracts have other things going on. How quickly it moves to those prices will change the premium of the, on, of the option contract in a different way. Um, how much time is left in the contract will change the premium of the contract in a different way. So sometimes Apple maybe moves $2 and you make $2 off of it per, per share. But in the options world, if it moves $2 and it moves $2 quickly or if it moves $2 and you have a lot of time left in your contract, it really changes how, what the premium change looks like rather than just a dollar to dollar move like the equities side would do. So there's advantages and disadvantages to trading with options. So the advantages here is leverage. That is a really big one. So you can control a larger amount of an underlying asset with a smaller investment, meaning that a contract, and we'll, I'll break it down for you guys in the next section here, but a contract might be, might only cost you $300, but to get into a shares position, it might cost you $30,000. So you have that ability, even with, if, whether you have a small account or a large account to really leverage your capital. There's flexibility here. So there's a wide range of strategies. So they're called options because you have options. There is a pun intended in this here. Um, there's a flexibility in how you trade. So whether you're a swing trader or an <laughs> intraday trader, yeah, you see that, Rob. Uh, th there's different ways to trade these strategies. Um, what's interesting about options is that you can actually be neutral in a position, meaning the stock is stuck in a range, which happens a lot of times. So I'm not expecting the stock to really go up or go down. I'm just expecting it to be stuck in a range. And there are strategies to play that and actually make money, uh, saying that it's never going to get out of this range. Risk management, there's a defined risk in certain strategies. So what we're trading intraday, just going um, buying calls and buying puts, uh, this has defined risk. So when you buy a contract, that's the most you can lose. So if I buy a contract that let's say costs me $100, then that is the most I can lose. So if I buy a call and it costs me $100 and the stock just tanks overnight, for instance, we'll use Tesla because it had earnings last night and it shot down, right? For anybody that bought calls in this position, in, the, in a position on Tesla, let's say that they bought one call and it cost them $100. Well, Tesla dropped like a bajillion percent. I don't even know what it is, but those calls are still only going to be risking them $100, no matter how far it drops. Tesla could go to zero and they still only lose $100. So there's there's a, a risk management bonus here with trading contracts, as long as you get in with the right amount of size, because if you size too big, options can get dangerous. Uh, there's lower costs for commissions, unless you're trading like hundreds of contracts. But if I get into a position and I buy one contract, it's going to cost me 65 cents to get in. And if I sell that contract, it's going to cost me 65 cents to get out. Now, in equities, I'm paying per share in the position for all the parcels that I'm doing along the way. So sometimes the commissions in equities can be a lot higher um, than they can actually be in contracts. Uh, Kareem, yes. So Megan, for the risk management for the contract, so example, if Tesla is a, is a one contract cost to you, example, like a dollar. So this means mm -hmm. you're paying time 100, so you're paying $100 for the contract, right? Correct, yes. So, but you say with the maximum loss, so the maximum loss is going to be your maximum $100. Correct. Right? But even like if you buy call, if you buy call, so the stock's supposed to be going up, so if the stock tank like go uh, like against you, so whatever whatever like you know you're gonna whatever what you're gonna lose a hundred dollar right? Correct. Okay, because okay, so that's what my point is. But whatever you make, the stock took uh, above the above the one dollar, like the hundred dollar. So this was like your money you make, right? Correct. Yes. All right. Thank you. That's You're right. welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do I'll I'll do a breakdown for you guys as well. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with how like premium pricing works and stuff on the contracts, you'll be able to see. Um, if the, so, Stoyan, that's a good point. So Stoyan's asking, what if they sold some puts on Tesla? Um, so 
I'm not covering as much on the sell side here because we're just going to be doing the buying side of calls and puts. Um, mostly because that's pretty much all I trade. Um, selling is a different story. So here where there is defined risk, like I said, in I say in certain strategies, defined risk happens when you buy contracts. So just when you buy them, you, are def you have a defined amount of risk. However much you pay for the contract is the most that you could lose. Now, when I say in certain strategies, there are ones where the risk becomes greater. So if you sell contracts from the start, similar to kind of shorting a stock, if you sell a contract, then your losses can be unlimited. So we're going to stick to just buying contracts. And when I say buying contracts, I don't mean that you're only going like long an equity stock, right? So when I say buy, you can buy calls if you're more long biased on the position and you can buy puts if you're more short biased on the position. Yeah, Esan. I've spent some time on options and to be honest with you, I find them incredibly complicated. Mm. And I, I I understand, of course, uh, buying puts and and buying uh, calls because simply you just minimize your risk. Whether it goes up and down, you can only lose a certain amount. Mm -hmm. But what I do find really interesting, and I don't want to get into you know really complicated uh, situations where people do iron condors and they do like all sort of like weird stuff. But one aspect of it that I really find interesting is that you can sell uh, a position. So you can sell a put or you can sell a call and you collect a premium. And if a certain stock reaches a certain price, then you get to purchase it. So, for example, you have like Microsoft at around like $405 right now. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes and tells you, Megan, would you invest $50,000 of your own money uh, into Microsoft at $350, uh, you would mm -hmm. say, yes, that's like, you know, 20% drop or whatever that is. So you could sell, uh, I think it's, you sell a call and you collect a premium. And if Microsoft reaches $350, then you buy Microsoft and then you can hold it. You can do whatever you want with it. You can wait for it to bounce and sell it, or you can just hold it long term. Have you ever done that, or? No, I've never. Mm -hmm. I've never actually changed any of my contracts into share positions. But you can do it. I mean, there are strategies mm -hmm. around it. So if you okay. want to sell something, and um, if you, but if you want to sell something, you, it it can be it can be risky because. I mean, there are definitely strategies around it to end up with shares that you want to end up in. But more likely, if you want a certain um, share, then it's better to actually buy that strike price and then get and then exercise your option to actually have those shares. Uh, when you're selling, then you you run the risk of being assigned, which is actually puts you on the opposite side of the trade, which is usually not where you want to be. So if you want the shares, you should be buying the contracts with an expectation that let's say you're buying something at 350 and once it, once it closes above 350, you can have those um, you can have those shares at that price. I'll, I can do a little bit more of a walkthrough and kind of draw my chart a little bit or on the screen okay. a little bit later. Okay, to show you. Okay. okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, so uh, time versus return. So there can be greater returns in less time when a stock is moving. So like I said, if Apple is moving from 190 to 191 to 192, in that scenario, we're just moving a couple dollars. So we've moved $1 or $2. Uh, but if it moves really fast, moves really quickly, and in not a lot of time, uh, the premium contracts can actually move much faster than that. So you can actually end up making more money. I was actually showing... Um, I was showing a one-on-one -on -one mentee yesterday, I believe it was, just kind of the difference between the two. And there was like a drop that happened for maybe, it was on the overall market. It happened for, you know, maybe, maybe it took like five minutes. And had they gone in with like one or two contracts, they would have ended up making almost $300 off of it. Um, I mean, it depends on what you're doing. But the stock itself only moved like a little bit. So it didn't move enough to actually give you $300 on an equities position, but because it moved so quickly on the option side, you could have actually capitalized more. So we can look at some of that as well. Um, the next thing is that there's no PDT rule. So I know some of you guys um, 
when you're ready to go live or if you ha already have, you will, some of you have small accounts. Um, so when you have a cash account with a broker, you can trade as much as you want without any PDT rule. So for those of you that are in the US, that's the pattern day trade rule, which allows you to only take a specific amount of, of trades per week uh, or within a five day rolling business period. Now, for those of you that are outside of the US, you are very lucky and you don't have to worry about that. Um, and you can take as many trades as you want, even if your account is under $25,000. But for those that are in the US, having a cash account rather than a margin account allows you to bypass the PDT rule. Now, if I have a cash account, however, that is only, let's say $5,000, then I could still take as many trades as I want with an equities position, but it doesn't really give me that much capital to actually um, buy into positions with. So if I, let's say if I want to get into a position like, we'll just say Tesla, if I wanted to buy uh, a Tesla position right now, and let's say, we'll just say it's around like 180, it's on its way. Uh, we'll say it's around 180. Um, if I want a hundred shares of Tesla, I have to have $18,000. Right. So if my cash account isn't big enough for that, then I can't take an equities position. So even though with cash accounts, you can trade as much as you want without the PDT rule, it is very hard to actually take positions because your account is so small and you don't have the margin to actually leverage and get into bigger positions. So what most traders do when they have a cash account and it's small is they go over to options because while Tesla might cost 18 grand to get into a position. And in the options world, it's going to cost a lot less. And you can actually get in in, the, in an options cash account. And I'll show you the breakdown on the next slide. Now, the disadvantages, however, to options, because there's never the good without the bad here, uh, complexity. So Asan was, men was mentioning complexity, right? They do require a deeper understanding in some regard. Now, there are simple ways to get started, and that's what I'm going to be teaching you today. Um, but they can be very complex, which after you start to learn them can somewhat be a good thing in a way uh, because there's so much that you can do with them. You don't just have to buy a position or sell a position. Like you can do so much stuff with them. Um, but yes, they can be very overwhelming for many people. Volatility. So prices can be highly volatile um, and you can lose a lot in them if you don't have your risk under control. So that's really, really important here. Uh, time decay. So one thing with option contracts is that whereas if I get into a position on, we'll just say Microsoft, um, I can hold that position for as long as I want. I could hold it until I'm 85 years old, which I'm getting close if you haven't recognized the gray on my head. Uh, but with options, there's an expiration date. So I can't hold them for 85 years unless I bought them 85 years out in time. Every contract you buy will have a date that it expires. So sometimes if you're trying to get a movement towards a certain area, whoops, my computer's possessed. It has decided that it does not want to present this anymore. <laughs> hold on, let me, uh, let me uh, go back. Okay, so if you ha decide that you, you're trying to get to a specific price, so you're trying to get to like 400 on Microsoft or something like that, well, you could hold that for years in an equities position. It's becoming sentient, it is. Um, you could hold that for years, getting it to go to that price, but in options, you can't. It has a certain time frame. Those contracts will expire. Um, so let's see. Let me just look at this really quick. I see Shane that you wrote something here. Is that, uh, is it a question? When you sell a contract, you end up in a scenario where you don't have the option to take the position at a certain price. You are short the option, meaning you have the obligation to take that position regardless of the, yeah. So you're responding to the conversation I was ha having with us on. Um, so yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is liquidity and high spreads. So whereas in the equities world, yeah, we have the high spreads to kind of worry about in a lot of stocks. Um, that are not our normal types of stocks. It can be even worse sometimes in the options world. Um, some options are like very thinly traded. You know, if you ever watch the pre-market show with BBT, uh, when Carlos looks at a pre-market, um, at the pre-market of a stock and it's just like, there's a little line here and there's a little line here and there's a little line here and like not normal price action movement. And then he throws the dumpster truck or dump truck or whatever at it. That is actually really common in the options world that you see things like that. So 
you have to be really careful that you're trading things that are really liquid and don't have such high spreads. Typically, I stick to things that are the bigger name tickers. So, you know, the Teslas, NVIDIAs, AMDs, those are very liquid um, and and usually easier to to trade to get in and out of so things to just kind of think about here advantages and disadvantages so let's take a look at the capital required for options versus equities so oh tesla uh, so let's say we have a tesla equity position here now let's say the top stock price is a hundred dollars maybe this is foreshadowing what's about to happen <laughs> i have no idea honestly um but let's say that the stock price is a hundred dollars for easy math purposes so if I buy 100 shares of this equity position, I do wish, Stoyan, I really do. <laughs> if I buy 100 shares, the capital required is $10,000, okay? Now, if I get into a Tesla option contract, let's say the strike price is $100, meaning that I'm basically just getting a contract at the same price that the stock is sitting at. So like i said with strike prices you could buy i could buy 105 i could buy 110 like i can buy it pretty much anywhere i don't have to buy it where the stock is sitting but let's say for instance i buy a strike price of 100 dollars while the stock price is also at 100 dollars. so i'm right there the premium will be 100 or sorry one dollar which is times 100 because each contract is similar to holding onto 100 shares so the premium's a dollar which means that it's going to end up being 100 dollars here <clears throat> so if i buy one contract the capital required is 100 dollars. so looking at these if i want to get into an equities position i have to put 10 grand on the line to get into this position not saying i'm going to lose 10 grand here but i'm going to need ten thousand dollars of capital to get 100 shares of tesla now in options i can use a hundred dollars and trade in a similar fashion i'm trading 100 shares here but with less capital so let me go back to that does anybody have questions on that breakdown at all I tried to keep it as simple as possible um now other strike prices cool other strike prices will have um other other uh premium prices so just to kind of give you an example maybe i'm um buying a call and i think that the um i think that tesla's going to go up so i i buy let's say maybe i buy a 105 call i think that it's going to go to like 110 so i buy somewhere in the middle i buy a call at 105 that contract for 105 may only cost me i don't know it's probably i'm just estimating i'm just going to say 65 cents it's probably like 85 or something like that but <clears throat> let's say it's 65 cents then this is only going to cost me 65 dollars to be in control of 100 shares of tesla this is going to cost me 65 dollars while this is going to cost me ten thousand dollars so there's a really big difference so you can see why people with small accounts like to get into the options world because they're able to trade alongside all the big players who have really big accounts so let's do a breakdown of what risk management looks like so the amount that you spend when buying calls or puts is the most that you can lose right so we just talked about that <clears throat> but the goal however is to never lose the amount of capital for the position so if i get into an options contract that i mean there are some where i'll put the entire contract on the line but if i get it like if i get into a position i'm never there to lose my entire premium so if i spend a hundred dollars on a contract I'm I'm not trying to let it go to zero. Like I'll cut a position similar to I would similar to how I would in the equities world. So if you get into a position on something and you spend like forty thousand dollars on an equities position, you're not in there to let that go to zero and lose forty thousand dollars on the position. You'll probably cut it when you're you know down four hundred dollars or something like that. So it's the same thing in the options world. There are <clears throat> plays that I do put on every once in a while where I'm willing to risk the whole thing. So. Um, you know there's strategies for that and everything <clears throat> sorry guys okay so for putting this in terms of kind of what we teach in terms of like risk management like a one to two r sort of ratio or scenario let's think in terms like that because the easiest way to learn something new is to take what you already understand about something that's similar and apply it in the best way that you can and then adapt it so we teach and for most people you guys understand that risking one R to make two R or more is usually the goal. Uh, and that is what creates a good looking equity curve. 
So let's say that we have a thousand dollar cash account. So with 10% risk of this account, we have a hundred dollars of buying power, right? Because 100 is 10% of a thousand. So if I used, if I use 10% of my account to get into an options position, I can buy enough contracts that equal a hundred dollars. So if I, if an Apple contract, one Apple contract costs $100, then I can buy one Apple contract. Now, if the contract is $20, I could buy five contracts, right? But this is the amount of capital I'm using from my account. So I'm using 10% of the account to get into the position, but I'm not there to lose 10% of the account. So now my stop loss is at 10% of the position, which would be a 1% loss of the entire account or $10 or one R. So 10% of this account is $100 of buying power. 10% of this is 1% of the entire account or $10. Now on the other side, we're looking for a gain of 2R or 20% or 2% of the full account. So thinking in terms of what we do with equities, it's the exact same. This can obviously be adjusted. There are times where I'll go half size on a position. So let's say I go use 5% risk instead. Um, I might go in with $50. We'll just use this as an example, $50. And it's something that maybe I'm giving more room, just like we do in equities. Then I could let, allow a 20% stop to hit a 1% loss of my position. So you can play with it, but this is just kind of the easy math for this scenario. But let's say that we have a $30,000 margin account. Well, we can just buy all kinds of contracts, right? Absolutely not. So we're going to look at our margin account in a very similar way because when we have a margin account and we are above PDT, we should never be looking at PDT as or anything below PDT as money that we just get to use all the time. Really, for those of you that are in the United States and have the PDT rule, anything 25K and below is technically zero to you. I want you to look at your accounts as it's technically zero because if you drop below $25,000, you actually don't get to trade anymore. So, or at least day trade until you get it back above $25,000. So when we have a $30,000 account, our risk, our amount of capital above PDT is $5,000. So going off of what we did here, the risk based off of 5,000 at a 10% risk is $500 of buying power. If we spend $500 on five Apple contracts at $100 each, so it was up here, it was one, $100 for one contract, but here we have a little bit more capital. So we can get in with five contracts. A 10% stop on this would be a $50 loss or one R of the account, 1% of the account. And a gain of 20% would be 2% of the account or a $100 win at two R. Does everybody understand the math breakdown here. Are we good? Do we have any questions about it? Stoyan has a question. Hit me. Hey, Megan. Like using this example now with Apple, when I tried trading options a bit in uh, TWS, it was always a bit hard for me to uh, determine how much contracts I want to buy depending on the stock because. For Apple, in this example, five contracts, it's good because Apple's ATR is relatively small. And uh, But five contracts for Tesla, for example, with a much, much bigger ATR, it's, it's a lot more exposure. And I'm curious, what, how do you determine the amount of contracts? Or maybe you buy the same amount of contracts and you just look at the delta and buy further out. How do you do it? Like yeah that's a great question no i always use the same amount of capital so i'm using a percentage of my account so in your scenario here where apple is um a 100 or 100 contract tesla my one contract of tesla might be like four dollars and fifty cents right or 450. well if my capital amount that i'm basing off of is five thousand dollars and there's a 10% risk, so I can only use 500, then I'm going to buy one contract. So the amount of contracts I buy will change based on how expensive the contracts are. And I'll always stay in line with my account and my capital and a percentage of my account. It's the same, say, similar scenario with trading equities. Like NVIDIA 
NVIDIA equity is like $600, right? But, um, you know, NEO is, I don't even know, 10 bucks or something like that. So if I got into NEO, I would buy way more shares than if I got into NVIDIA. It's the same thing. Does that make sense? Um, I think so. But like, uh, if you're buying one contract on Tesla at 450, um, you, let's say it's at the money, right? And the Delta is 50 cents. Mm -hmm. uh, you're looking for a 10% stop, which is 50 bucks. So you're basically giving a $1 stop loss on Tesla, right? Because if it falls down $1, your uh, contract is 50 cents. Um, in, yeah, in this scenario, they're actually kind of the same. So 10% of this is also kind of a, is, is a delta of basically like 50. So in this scenario, it's basically the same. But I am looking at the percentage no matter what. So if this was like, you know, if this contract was 850 and it went down 10%, I'd lose $85. Um, so I wouldn't be looking at the delta in that scenario. The delta on that for a dollar drop might be, you know, 50 bucks but I'm looking at the 10%. Oh man, this is, this always gets me. I don't know. I don't know how to manage it. So, so let's say you want to, you want to give $2 of stop loss on Tesla. Won't you just buy something that's further out of the money and allow you to, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't yeah, know no, I no, that's, say. it's a good question. You have a great question. So, um, so for those of you who don't trade options, yes, you can buy contracts that are further, away so if something is sitting if a stock price is sitting at like i said a hundred dollars i could buy a contract at 110. sometimes yes i will buy them further away if i need to get it within my risk management for the most part i'm buying as close to the stock price as possible so if tesla's at 180 i'm going to attempt to buy to buy um contracts at the 180 strike but let's say my account was really small and let's say right now those strikes are like 800 dollars. then if i think it's going down today and i have a target i might buy something along the way that's a little bit less expensive to get it within my risk management so to get it within here to be able to actually get a contract without overexposing myself Okay, one last question. When you were doing the $1,000 account challenge with options, mm -hmm. uh, were you in the beginning when your account was like literally $1,000 and smaller, were you sticking to smaller ATR stocks like, for example, AMD, Apple, Amazon because yeah. of the volatility of the bigger names? Yeah, it wasn't because of the volatility. It was because I couldn't afford the contracts. And I don't like going super far out of the money. I really like trading close to the stock price because I don't know, I just like how the contracts move. And when you're far away, if it never actually gets there, you put yourself in a position of not actually making a lot off of it. Um, and sometimes if it goes the other way, like it's just it's going to be harder to actually make money on the position. So I like being as close to the price as possible. Um, but I I'm not going to get into all of them today, but I do have scenarios where I will trade uh, further out of the money. Like I mean, like Tesla, for instance, earnings was coming. That's going to cause something to move really quickly. I bought like fifteen dollars out of the money. Right. Like we were at two ten yesterday. I bought one ninety. I bought. 100 i bought 20 bucks out of the money on that that's really rare um but if i need it to be within my capital yes so when i started with a thousand dollar account to grow that one i did not trade tesla i i didn't trade it at all because i uh, most of the times i would have needed to be like 10 bucks out of the money to actually be able to get into a position and it just was too far for me so i traded things like yeah like amd i traded amazon uh i traded like I don't know, shop, I think I traded. Um, yeah, so great question though. I mean, it really it always comes back to capital. So just if you can keep your risk within a percentage of your capital, that's the most important part. Because if you lose all of the risk that you put on, like, yes, you would lose 10% of your account. But just think if I got into this Tesla position and my my account was like, really small or i got into like two contracts of tesla or something like that like my i might be risking 50 percent of my account which is just way too much so you have to go off of how big your account is and manage your your size according to that um yes craig 
Is there any way um, I trade options, but when I learned how to trade, I did a lot of the um, synthetic hedging using okay. like verticals. Mm -hmm. is, is there any way to do that using this particular method or is just straight naked calls, naked puts? This is this is just straight long calls, long puts. So buying them, um, it, this is kind of just touching on a small account. Small accounts can't actually do what you're talking about here because you cannot sell on a small account. Okay. So just just buying, just buying. If you gotcha. if you guys yeah, if you guys want to be selling options, you're gonna need to have margin, or you're gonna have a need to have a pretty large cash account because you need to be able to secure the fact that if this stock goes in the completely different direction, you have enough capital to cover the assignment. And I, it's I'm not gonna like get into all of that, um, but just know that we're just buying here, buying calls, buying puts. We're gonna keep it simple. Uh, Dave. Uh, yeah, make a like. So I just like to add one thing into this one. If we go with the uh, low ATR uh, tickers, like so, with the options, we end up paying like more of the commissions, like uh, like saving on uh, saving on the small amount. Like so, this is what I have experienced so far. So the cost of the contract is expensive. Like so, it's not like they are cheap. Like okay, plus the mm -hmm. commissions, like okay, even more expensive there. Like so, so that's why I uh, like to choose the ticker which I have. Uh, uh, higher ATR rather than going with these small tickers, which in which you have to buy like a, a more number of the contracts uh, to make like the same kind of the move, which you can make take make a move like in the one contract of uh, Tesla or Nvidia. Like so, that's what I find find it out. Yeah, it depends on how many contracts you're buying. Because for people that are only buying like two or three contracts, they're only paying a few dollars in commissions. But if you're out here buying stuff that's super far out of the money, um, and or or buying just a lot of contracts, no matter what, then you are going to be paying a lot in commissions. But the beauty of options is that, you know, I can take two or three contracts and still make a decent return off of them and pay, you know, three dollars in commissions. Whereas if I buy you know 300 shares and i partial a bunch of times like i'll be paying com like more commissions there so i it can be like similar it can be completely different it really depends on how many contracts you're getting in with uh okay i see i'm just gonna pop over here really quick to the chat uh yeah okay yeah so i answered that um yeah, Paul, selling is great. Like, but this is more so, but once you get into selling, you do start to put on some risk and um, you need to be able to understand options enough to be selling to know what's happening here. Um, but yes, selling is great because you actually don't really need the stock to go anywhere if you don't want to. You just need that, <clears throat> that contract to basically expire. So I'm not going to get into that, but um, yeah, selling is great. Uh, okay, so Eric, yes. Hopefully, two quick questions. Um, let's say you do start off with a thousand dollar account, and um, you uh, you lose two in a row. Are you going to be moving that ten percent down immediately, or are you still going to do the hundred dollars? And then, conversely, as you start winning, are you raising the risk amount immediately? That's a great question. So, if it goes down, <clears throat> I'm adjusting it immediately. If it goes up, you can adjust it immediately, or you can put it on like a weekly or bi-weekly or something basis. That's kind of up to you. Um, I actually like to adjust mine at the end of the week. So um, just because there might be some days during the week where maybe it goes up and down a little bit, um, I usually wait until the end of the week to adjust the size. Um, and some people like to wait till the end of the month just to give them kind of some cushion. But if it goes down, yes, I adjust it. And the the name of the uh, presentation is intraday uh, options trading. Now, if you let's say you're you've got a ten percent gain or a five percent loss on your position, mm -hmm. would you then let that sink or uh, play overnight into the next day? How long are you holding a position until you uh, get rid of it? Usually pretty quickly because it's intraday. So if it's specifically an intraday trade, which is what we're talking about here, then I'm usually getting out of the position before the end of the day. So 
similar to, to shares. Like we're not holding anything overnight for a swing unless it's specifically a swing. So I'll get out of the position before the end of the day. Megan, just a question. Uh, so if you, if you uh, sell them before the end of the day, then the expiry would not be for that day, right? For the right. It would be for the end of week or next week or something. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Unless it's Friday, then yes, the expiration would be that day. Because if you hold a intraday option and it's, it's expiring same day, by the end of the day, it would anyways be zero, right? If it's the same day expiration, yeah, yeah. If it, if it hasn't gone in your direction, if it's gone in your direction, yeah, you can make money off of it still by the end of the day. Um, but you want to close the position. You don't want to hold on to it anyways, because if you hold on to it, then you get, are going to get assigned those shares. So just to keep everything safe and not get assigned shares and not be holding positions into swings overnight that weren't planned as swings, then um, yeah, just closing it before the end of the day. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. You got it. Okay. So <clears throat> let's move on to what's next. Okay. So in the money, at the money, out of the money. Uh, so like I said, there are different types of contracts. So there is an in the money contract, which means the option has some intrinsic value, meaning that if Apple is trading at 150 and a call option strike price that I purchased is at 140, I'm in the money and I have $10 of intrinsic value. So meaning that when this expires, this contract will still be worth $10. So it will never be at zero because it has that intrinsic value because the price of this is below the current stock price. So Apple's up here at 150 on the stock chart. So we got 150 here. And the contract that I have is down here at 140. So it's going to hold $10 of intrinsic value right here. All right. At the money is when the option strike price is the same as the current market price of the underlying assets. So if Apple's trading at 150 and the call option strike price is at 150 as well, then we're at the money. This is what I'm usually trading. Part of the reason too is that at the money strikes, if they start to move quickly can be much easier to make some um, quick gains off of. Also, slightly one strike out of the money can also be good for that as well. Um, they start to just move a little bit quicker, and you'll notice that if you're watching your premiums uh, change. Out of the money is what it says here, which is that they don't have any intrinsic value, and it's when you are a lot of times speculating, or maybe you got into something and it went the other direction, but a lot of times, like if let's say Apple's at 150 down here and you think it's going to go up to uh, 160, it has no intrinsic value. And the only value that this holds is time and volatility because it's not up there yet. So you need to get it to move in that direction for you to make money on the contract. So out of the money contracts, you can make a lot of money on. But one thing that I will say is that if you don't have enough time for it to start moving in that direction, a lot of the time these out of the money contracts, the premium starts to uh, deteriorate, it starts to decay and you start to lose on the position. So I find these when you're new to trading options and you don't have a specific strategy for this type of contract yet, trading something that's as close to the strike price or the current stock price it, as possible is one of the easiest ways to start and one of the safer ways to start. If you wanted to go one strike out of the money, that would probably be okay too. Um, they can, yeah, more, they are a little bit more expensive and I can show you guys the options chain so you can kind of see the difference. Um, why don't I just actually bring one over here right now? Let's bring up, uh, well, let's just bring up Google cause this is what's sitting here. So, Google right now, if I bring over the stock, is sitting at 152.86. So an at the money option on this would be somewhere around 152.50 maybe. You'll notice that these strike prices, sometimes, sometimes they're a dollar each. So sometimes it goes from 46 to 147, 148. But as stocks um, become more expensive, sometimes they'll start to give you uh, two and a half dollar wide strikes. So instead of going from 148 to 149 to 150, they'll start to go like 160 to 162.50 uh, and so on. So this 
uh, stock right here is sitting somewhere around this 152.50 uh, option price, option contract right here. So right now, this 152.50 or at the money option is going to cost a dollar 14 for a call times 100. So it's going to be 114 dollars. Now, if I think this is going to go to 155, then I can look at the 155 contracts, and because they expire tomorrow, they're pretty cheap. They're 30 cents or $30 a contract. So I could get, you know, roughly three of these contracts for the amount that I can get this one at the money contract. Now there's not a lot of time left in these. So if tomorrow this doesn't go to 150 and through it, then these are gonna expire worthless. Whereas if I buy this contract, then it's holding some intrinsic value as it starts to push away from that. Um, so just things to keep in mind they can be more expensive to be at the money it also depends on what you're trading what time frame you're trading them in so how many weeks or days do they have until expiration because if i switch over these are pretty cheap right now but if i switch over to next week and i do february 2nd's expiration so contracts are expiring on fridays unless you are unless it's an etf like spire queues those expire every single day um but here's one for next week on Google. So if I go to next Friday and I go to the same contracts, 152.50s are trading for $4.65 because they have six more days until expiration. So $465 for a contract here. And the 155s are trading for basically $350. Whereas for tomorrow, they're trading for 30 cents. So this is giving more time for it to get up to 150 and through it, 155 and through it. Whereas tomorrow, it it needs to get there like now basically um so they can be cheap they can be expensive it really depends on what expiration you pick and what strike you pick um on the options chain yeah Esan. um so can you actually give an example of what is it that you because i mean we can go on about uh trading the day after or whatever because we don't have that much time. I just want to see what is it that you, like how do you exactly make money out of this? So for example, if you're buying Google mm -hmm. uh, at 152.5 strike, like when is the expiry? Like how are you making money out of it? If it moves up, like are you holding it until the next day? If it moves up $2, you sell it? Like what is it that you exactly do? Yeah, so I'm still trading the chart. So I don't think about it in terms of like, I'm gonna um, sell it because it moved up $2. I mean, I do think in terms of percentages, but I'm trading the chart. So I can use Google as an example because I did trade Google today and I still have some contracts left in the position. Uh, if I bring over my Google position here. Now, I, I don't trade necessarily 10% like I'm showing in here. This is a way to get you guys started and get your feet wet. I'm yeah. trading the chart. So if I bring up this chart here, mm -hmm. my strategy today was a break of uh, pre-market high. So a break of this white line here with keeping these lows intact for a move up towards all time high and through it towards 155. So I'm trading the chart until the chart tells me that it's done. And right now we're continuing to get higher highs and continuing to push, there's not a lot of selling occurring yet. Now, this is what the, the options contract looks like. So if I got into a Google position at 150 area, I would have paid $150 per share. Now on the Google uh, option side, I'm trading the 150 contracts and I'm paying about a dollar per contract. So as this moves up right now, these contracts are worth about $3. So as this moves up, I each contract that I'm in, no matter how many I'm in, they're each worth $300. So if I bought five, let's just say, or let's say I bought, let's say I bought 10 for easy math purposes. So I would be spending a thousand dollars on the position. And right now it, this position would be up 3K. Okay. And when is, when is this position expiring? Like when you buy it, like, is it expiring end of the day or like? Yeah. So I always buy end of week expiration unless it's Friday. So right now any trades that i've taken this week in options they all expire friday but on friday i don't like to trade when there's no time left in the contract so on friday i switch to next week so this these ones expire tomorrow if i was trading this tomorrow i would have contracts that expire the next week 
So hold on. So if they expire tomorrow, if they expire tomorrow, and say the stock price stays around where it is right now, you make three k. You just let it expire. I don't let it expire. I'm gonna get out of it because. So how do you get out of it? You have you just, to sell it to somebody. Yeah, yeah. You just sell it. So it's similar to buying shares and selling shares. Same thing. You're hmm. just buying contracts and selling them back to the market. So why why would somebody buy uh, your position if it's closing on Friday and like 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 what's in it for them? So it. market makers, not necessarily other people, but market makers have to facilitate the trade. So hmm. they have to sell me that they have to buy my contracts for, back for me. Mm -hmm. And then without getting too complicated, they hedge their position with shares. I'm not gonna go into it, but the market makers have to let me out of the position here if, okay. if it's worth something. And there are, I mean, think, think, of trading, think of trading shares, right? Sometimes you buy a position and someone's shorting it and you're like, why are you shorting this position? This is clearly a long and vice versa. Same thing. There's probably someone up here that right now that's trying to sell this contract, thinking that it's going to just come down or buy this contract, thinking that it's going to maybe go up really high. So there's someone in here that maybe doesn't understand options enough or doesn't understand chart technicals enough or just has a completely different strategy that's also buying and selling these contracts. And maybe they're for more complex positions um, that do work for such a short amount of time. So there's so many ways to trade them that there is going to be someone on the other side of this position here. As, okay, long, as, how, as long as it's I, not super far out of the money, because sometimes there's no one out there for you. And you mentioned about expanding the position into next week. Like, how do you do that? Yeah. So if you're looking at your um, options chain here, there is an expiration date at the very top of the um, this area right here. So right now we're on January 26th expiration. I'm not clicked on it right now, but that's what these contracts were. So that's okay. tomorrow. If I want to switch to next week, I just click on February 2nd. And now all the contracts for February 2nd are here. When Next oh, week, but this, go to this February 9th. No, but this position, you're already inside this position and mm -hmm. it's expiring tomorrow. So how do you expand the position that you're currently in? You I'm, not I'm not expecting, oh, I'm not expecting, I'm going to close it today. Ah, okay, okay. I thought you said that, okay, if you want to let it run longer, you oh, expand it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, 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 that's called, that's called rolling. I'm not doing that. I, ah, okay, yeah, okay, because, okay. Unless it was a swing. If it was supposed to be a swing and I was expecting something, I might roll it into next week or the week after. Mm -hmm. um, they're just intraday trades so i'm getting in and, and getting out okay so the most you're in the position is what like two three days before friday if, you try to get out no if i'm swinging mm. the most i'm in a position is the same day so oh, yes the same day okay so yes yes so yesterday if i bought contracts i sold them at the end of the day mm -hmm, unless mm -hmm. it was unless it was specifically a swing trade okay i got it thank you okay yep you got it all right uh eric so, uh, hopefully a quick one. Now, you mentioned that the market makers are obligated to uh, fill the position, but one of the things that is a requirement for the options trading is the liquidity of it. Uh, where does that intersect with the need for, how, like, assuming the market makers have to fill your position, then wouldn't that imply like infinite liquidity? or it it would except it does depend on the contracts so there is a lot of liquidity when we're at the money which is why i push for people to trade closer to at the money or like one or two strikes away from it where we start to get things start to get sketchy and i'll show you what it looks like on a chart like today this looks like it's trading mostly like a stock chart but if i start to go out of the money so this is a 150 uh, position if i start to go out to like 170 let's say it starts to look like this there's not a lot of liquidity up here and there's not necessarily sometimes you'll get into a position where the market makers aren't going to fill this out here um and no one's going to be out here to facilitate it because there's not a lot of liquidity so but when you're close to where you're sitting right now like the price is sitting right now someone's got to take that position so if i sell this contract now and the price is I'm in the money on it and there's intrinsic value, someone will fill this position. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Uh, Atif. Yeah, Megan, so this is a great example of Google today, yeah? So, so you actually picked up the position on the break of the pre-market high, which was 151, mm -hmm. and you got the contract for tomorrow's expiry, right? Mm -hmm. So you actually went in the money, right? 
Okay. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the money right now. The uh, the contract so that I bought. When bought oh, when the... I took the con. Yeah, when I took the contract, it was slightly in the money. Like it wasn't super in the money, but yes, when I took it at pre market high, we could say that it's in the money. But it's it's not that far away from it, so it's still kind of considered at the money. It's kind of a gray area. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be more in the money when it actually gets to the strike price. That's one strike away. Oh, okay, okay. But then when you are buying the contracts, like say, let's say today, then you are only buying for Friday, not for the next Friday, right? So that's the that's the kind of setup you have. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some times on a Thursday where just depending on how I feel, I might buy next Friday because they're they just make me feel they're less chaotic sometimes. Right. Um, because the closer you get to expiration, the more chaotic the premium is. Um but definitely on Friday, I pick next pick next week. Thursday, I'll usually pick this week, but sometimes I'll switch to next week. Oh, this is a great example. Thank you for sharing okay. that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Uh, Gurinder. Yeah. Uh, so you do you pay attention to the open interest? Like um, th that's basically the volume you see on right on um, on. A yeah. Great question. So this is. Open interest and volume is what's telling you where the liquidity lies in an options contract. So when I'm looking at these numbers here, you can see how like as we're kind of like in this general area of like right about somewhere around here, I can see that the volume is rather high. There's like a it's kind of like a bell curve, right? It comes up and it comes down and the open interest seems to be quite a bit higher a lot of the time as well. Um, I do pay attention to it when the contracts start moving so because i'm buying at the money typically it's going to be high no matter what um but as it starts moving like for instance today on google what i noticed was i was watching the volume on these contracts and what i noticed today was as it was moving there was a pretty there was a pretty large amount of volume around 152.50 and i wasn't sure like similar to our l2 and equities like would we actually be able to get through that and if you look at the chart you'll notice that that's where i started partially in a bit as like i started to see it struggle because there was so much liquidity and volume at that strike but what i started to notice and the reason why i still have some of my position is because at that time this volume at the strike price of 155 was sitting around like nine or eight thousand, and look at it now—it's at twenty thousand. So as this has been moving, people are buying calls further out in time, or there's more—not necessarily buying, but there is more volume happening further away from the price. So as it's moving, I'll watch to see if the volume is increasing as we're heading in a direction. All right. So that, that that's basically a level two like kind of indicator that like how many people are buying it it is and what's crazy is that like people who don't trade options don't even realize there's a whole other side to the market out here like this is a this is basically a level two in some regard of being able to see where buyers and sellers are like placing their orders in the options market yeah so d does the spread uh depend on the open interest too like so it, it'd be much lighter to buy calls at 155 because there's so many people are doing transactions uh if the open interest is low the spread is higher is that kind of what it is yeah yeah it's it kind of depends on the stock like even if i get like i've seen baba have a lot of volume but the spread can still be really high so it does kind of depend on the stock but yes the closer you are to have the money the tighter it's going to be like for instance let's see if i can get an example on this like it, right right now we're around, around like 152 or whatever so 152.50 the spread on this is where are we at here 152.50 the spread on this is about two cents for these contracts but if i go further in the money i'm looking like if we go down here 15 cent spread 865 to 880 and if i go further out in the money i'm probably not going to be able to see anything today maybe uh oops once now because they're expiring tomorrow these aren't going to be the spread's not going to be that big but if they were further out of the money on a further like on a later date maybe we would see like a bigger spread uh like if i go out to like 177.50 no they're actually they're still kind of tight um yeah i had a i took a trade a few days ago on nvidia and i i paid i think like more than 20 cents in spread and it was it burnt me um it was yeah not good experience yeah similar to um so one so yes it's something to watch for when you are out of the money or further in the money but another thing to think about is 
in the equities world, like a NVIDIA might have a 10 cent spread on the stock side, which is normal for it. And on the equity side, it might also have a wider spread. So just because it's such a high price stock. Yeah. So definitely pay attention to that. Thank um, you. Yeah, you got it. Uh, Jacob. Hi, Megan. Uh, two questions. So the IV account doesn't have the stop loss uh, options trading, right? Uh, because I, I always found like, because I, I never had the, it in DAS, so I always used uh, IB. It only shows the contract amount and that's it pretty much, I guess, right? You So, but you're asking about a stop loss? Yeah. Yeah, so in IB, you can set a percentage stop um, oh. on the position. It's in your like, order entry window that you can pop up. Um, there's a advanced like, no, it, I take that back. It is in the um, the buttons that you can add to your options trader, your options chain. Uh, you can create a new button and that button can be to add a, uh, to add a stop loss when you enter a position or add a stop loss later. Um, okay. And in DOS you can as well. So I just use, I have a 10% hotkey when I wanna throw that one on. I also, um, can use my equities hotkey to double click on the options chart and place okay. a stop where I want to place a stop. So the second question is how, how do we activate the options in DAS? Like, yeah, so you won't be able to do it in the, um, in the boot camp, but outside okay. of the boot camp, if you want to, you just go to the, um, uh, the page where you purchased, where you purchased DOS on the BBT yes. website and there's a drop down of add-ons. Oh, okay. The, the add-on that you need is called OPRA, O-P-R-A, level two, okay. and that will add options to your account. Okay, got it. Thanks, Megan. Cool. Yeah, you got it. Brandon. Thanks, Megan. So I've been interested in getting into this. So TOS or uh, IBKR, which to just dip my toe in, I have accounts both, but I, I don't want to do it with real money at first. I want to practice. I know Toss has a replay or something. Let me pull up the account. I just, I mean, I'm looking at it and it's like, I guess the first time I opened DOS, it was the same, but oh my gosh, there's so much going yeah. on. Yeah, you know, both TOS and Interactive Brokers Trader Workstation are, they're like the Ferraris of trading, ah. right? They, I mean, they have everything. Like they're just, they're just full, full of stuff. So they can take a while to learn. I think either one you decide to go with is going to be beneficial. They both can do basically the same things in the options world. Um, it's mostly about which one you understand the best. Um, so I would play with both of them and just see like how you like them. Um, I'm trying to think, I, I don't have TOS, I have interactive brokers and you do have to pay for options data in interactive brokers, even if you, I think even if it's a SIM account, you might have to look into that, but I want to say that with okay. TOS, it might be free, that I data. Think, I think it is. I know Carlos or Eamon, I think it might have been Eamon, started with TOS, but I, I'll try it out. I didn't know if you okay. had any personal experience. Okay, free. cool. Yeah, my, yeah. Mike is saying, yeah, it's free. And yeah, IB, I had to pay like, I have to pay like 15 bucks a month or something to get options data. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Um, all right. Let me move this over here and over here and over here. Okay. So applying options to popular strategies. So when we trade options, it's really important that, let me get this, I got to minimize some of the stuff that I've made large. <laughs> uh, it's all good, Eric. I'm here for the questions. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm in the hot seat over here. Um, so Applying options to popular strategies. So when you're trading an options contract, they're going to work better when you're buying calls and buying puts if they move quickly. So the, the best strategies to trade for options really are the breakout trades. Like if you're trading like a five minute ORB or a high of day break or a range break or you know higher time frame break or R4 breakout, anything that starts with breakout is gonna be a much, um, better options trade for the most part because of how quickly it moves we want speed when we're in a directional position in options we want it to move fast what you'll notice is if you get into contracts where it, the price action just kind of stalls and sits around for a little while 
you might have a difficult time getting your premium to change um, and, and it might just cause you some heartache here. So breakouts are good. Gap fills are also good because there's room for the stock to move. Um, so, you know, it has room for it to, to drop, right? There's nothing in the way. So gap fills are good. Um, heavy bounces or rejections. So like range extremes, range extreme reversals. Um, when we're using like Camarilla pivot points, S3 to R3 traverse can be good. Uh, the best ones are the ones where like you get a lot of volume at S3 and it starts that push really fast or vice versa. So just always remember speed. So when you're looking at your chart, think like how much stuff does this have to get through and how easy would it be to move? Patterns, so bear flags, so this goes back to breakout stuff, right? So anytime there's like a, a break of a pattern, you're going to start to get that movement. And, you know, in just like a psychology sort of standpoint, this is where people start to add into positions, cover positions. You're going to get that volume as patterns start to break, um, and these can be really good. So just looking at like a larger time frame um, setup here. So you guys know that I like to trade the larger time frames. So this is just a range that formed over the course of a couple of weeks here or a month or for a little while here. This is the daily chart on NVIDIA back in the day. Uh, the day that it broke out of this range here, this is the type of thing we're looking for in the options world. So I'm looking for something to get out of range. So whether it's you could look at this as even if it wasn't a one day chart, this could be a pre-market five minute range. That's really clean. NVIDIA or Netflix yesterday is a great example of that. Um, it's formed a range in the pre-market. I'll actually just bring that over here and show you guys really quick. I didn't trade it, um, but I was looking at it yesterday. And if we go, this would be yesterday here. You'll notice this type of range break, we get that movement, like that really fast movement. So opening range breakouts, range breakouts, just in general, um, whether it's on a daily chart or a five minute chart or a 60 minute chart, we're going to get those pops. And that's what really helps the contracts uh, change in premium. So we'll get into, you guys have heard me mention Confluence many times in this uh, class, but this is a uh, a confluence setup. So this is that same range on NVIDIA. And a few days after that break, when it pulled back, it pulled back and created this larger time frame trend line. Uh, and on this day, we got a pop from here to here. Now on this chart, obviously this doesn't look that big, but you all know that NVIDIA moves like $15. So, um, you know, that's, that's a really big move uh, for a breakout trade. So this is what we are looking for. AMD, same thing. This is a channel break, so channel breaking out of this channel. And if you're if you like swing trading, you know you could think about taking swing positions like this uh, when we get out of bigger picture. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to take the intraday trade to make some money off of it when it first pops, and then I might buy contracts further out in time with the money that I made today. So then I'm just risk free and I'm just getting in with money that the market gave me. Yeah, Atif. So uh, just a question on the swings. What's, but what did you find the best recommended time? I mean, the further you go, the uh, contracts become expensive. Is there a time you figured out that over two months out, one month out uh, on the swing so, options? So it depends on uh, how long you think it's going to take. So I, I use how long I think it's going to take along with um, ATR. So for instance, let's say that I think AMD is going to break out on over here and it's going to come up to this price point here. I don't know what this price is. Let's just say, let's say this was a hundred dollars and let's say this is 150. So I think that it's going to go up to 150. Now using ATR, I want to calculate how long it's, I think it's going to take to get there. Obviously this isn't 150 because this happened in three days and AMD's ATR is like $4 or was like $4 at, probably at this time. Um, so let's actually say that this is like, I don't know, 120, we'll go to 120. So I'm going to use the ATR on this and account for pullbacks. So if I think it's going this direction, if I think it's starting a trend, then I'm going to get my contract usually somewhere in the middle because ideally I want it to get past my strike price and continue on to this destination. And I'm going to calculate how far out in time based on its ATR and how long I think it's going to take. So if it moves like four, three or $4 a day, I'm going to add that up and say, okay, to get from this price point to this price point, how much ATR is that? And then I'm going to give it some cushion. So usually I'm buying at least two weeks out in time. 
sometimes a month. Uh, it depends. It really depends on where I think it's going to go and how long I think it has to take to get there. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great way of doing it. I I actually never thought about it. I generally I never did the day trading with options, but I was using options on longer term. But I mm -hmm. learned painfully that the theta, you know, the, the the time decay kind of kills the contract values very very fast. Then the price can go there. But what yeah. you're explaining is makes total sense. That hey, look at the ATR, consider the you know cyclical nature, and then go for that. Thank you. Yeah, Pardon. yeah, exactly. And and ideally too, like you want to be out of the contract before expiration. So when I'm thinking about it, I don't think like okay, it needs to get there by the end of two weeks. I think like if I'm gonna buy a two week contract, it better get there within like a week because I want to get out of it and still have that extrinsic value of time and volatility. Because if I wait all the way until close, I'm not capitalizing on also having extrinsic value with my intrinsic value. So I'll give it that cushion so I can close the contract before before that, before that it even expires. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Really yeah, you. you're, you're welcome. Uh, Dave. Yeah, Megan, like, so the, uh, this one is like good for the swing, uh, swing position, right? Like if you want to swing something uh, in this yeah. way. Exactly. Yeah. So using breakouts on the bigger time frame for a swing trade is a, is a great, a great thing to do. Thank you. Yep. You got it. You guys can also swing trade on pullbacks. There are plenty of traders that do that as well. If that's, if that's your jam, um, completely, you know, you got to go with your style. You got to have a strategy around it, but anything that's breaking, um, is, is going to give you usually that push to, to get those contracts moving quickly. Uh, Mike, the cams. So the cams were part of the reason why I took Google. Uh, yes. So it was outside of R4 this morning on the intraday. It was outside of the daily and weekly cams um, as well of R4. And on top of that, it's continuing to make new highs and it's in a trend long. So I took the pre-market high break for a continuation towards all-time high to then break all-time high and hopefully continue on. We'll see how it does the rest of the day. But uh, if it just hangs out here for too much longer, I'll probably get rid of my contracts. So similar to uh, swing type plays, also on the intraday, if you are an ABCD trader, um, you know, if you're looking for ABCD trades, ABC, you can buy this at the, you can do it, at, buy at the C, just like you could in the equities world, um, and then take it for the break here, or you can buy it at the D for the, the breakout here. So you can really use very similar strategies. Really options are just getting comfortable with how they move and uh, what strike prices and expiration dates you like. So if you do decide to play with them, I highly advise doing like one contract, like one single contract and just seeing how it moves so you can get familiar with it. And of course, in SIM. As an options trader that's buying calls and buying puts, this is what we do not want to see. When we get stuck in directional days like this, it's absolutely terrible. This is where we start the premium, just it just decays. So it's where you could get into a position in queues and let's say this was like 300 bucks if my contract was 300 bucks and it chops around like this suddenly it's going to be like 250 and then maybe two dollars and then maybe 195 whereas this is going to stay 300 the entire time so we need that movement it's super super important uh, and for those of you i already showed you an options contract uh chart but just to kind of get familiar with what they look like this is a google trade when it rolls over um above a higher time frame level so we've got a higher time frame level here taking this short for this quick drop in the um in, on google itself on the equity side this level to play was about 125 85 or so and this dropped down to about 124 85 so it moved about a dollar so google moves about a dollar if i'm buying puts the contract is going to go this direction because I want the price to go up. These puts were bought at like 150 and this moves up to about uh, 220 or so. So a similar change. So a hundred dollar change basically or close enough, um, but with less capital. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around. I know this was a long one today. I have a feeling they're all going to be long ones because there's so many of you and there's so many great questions, but um, love spending time with you guys. So enjoy the rest of your day. I will catch you next week. And um, yeah. Have a good one. Later, everybody. Bye.